Good morning. Before I start my talk, I would like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me and also obviously for doing such a great job in organizing this conference uh, here in Malaga. It has been an amazing week um, so far and I do hope that in two years when we organize the conference uh, in Brussels, it will be as successful and as pleasant um, uh, as this one. And of course, I will also use this opportunity to invite you all to Brussels and I hope we will see all of you there uh, to enjoy Belgian beer, Belgian chocolates, waffles, fries, and of course, also groundwater science. Um, my talk today will be about the challenges of incorporating realistic geological heterogeneity into groundwater models. Um, we will, in this talk, look back at the research we have been doing on this topic for quite some while, take a step back and look at the lessons we have learned uh, from all this research and look at the challenges that are still remaining. So, this talk today will not be a typical introduction, methods, results, conclusion talk, um, but I will rather structure my talk um, following the five main lessons I have learned um, during this journey. Um, so, I will show, for example, why geological heterogeneity is important and how we can incorporate it into groundwater models. And I could stop there, and then this would have been a very straightforward um, talk, but I won't, because that would not be um, a very honest talk. Because incorporating heterogeneity into groundwater models, as you will see, can be very challenging, but also frustrating. And um, besides the successes in this field, we also have had our failures, our disappointments, um, things for sure that we would have done differently um, with everything we know now. So I will also um, discuss um, those things and of course focus mainly on the lessons that we have learned from all this. Okay, lesson one. This is a very obvious and straightforward one. Um, geological heterogeneity and the uncertainty about this matter. Um, so, there have been plenty of researchers who have shown that geological heterogeneity results in often very complex patterns of spatial variability of hydraulic conductivity, and this often has a significant effect on flow and transport um, in groundwater. It matters in all kinds of geologic media, it matters on many different scales, um, and it also matters for very different applications. I have, um, for example, spent quite some time working on a sand aquifer um, in, uh, in Belgium, the Brussels um, aquifer. And this sand from a distance might look quite homogeneous, but if you look closer, you can see um, this kind of... Well, this kind of um, geological heterogeneity. So we have very uh, thin clay drapes within the sand which show quite um, complex patterns of um, heterogeneity. And what we have done in this work is mapping all these um, clay drapes, their orientation, their thicknesses, um, how they occur, where and so on. We also uh, measured um, hydraulic conductivity at many different places and at different scales in this aquifer to see how this geological heterogeneity relates to um, heterogeneity in hydraulic conductivity. We have put all this information into groundwater flow and transport models and we could see, for example, that indeed these clay drapes, although they are small and although um, they are thin, they do have a significant effect on how, for example, a contaminant plume would move in this type of sand. After we established that, we applied these models on many different applications. For example, we interpreted a pumping test, taking this heterogeneity uh, into account and without this heterogeneity, and we could indeed see that these clay drapes result in an anisotropic pumping cone, um, for example. So if we would not take these effects into account in interpreting this pumping test, we would have a run um, results. We also did a groundwater tracer test um, in the same aquifer um, where we could also see that these clay drapes affect how the tra tracer would move um, in the subsurface. And then we also did some calculations to see 
um, how the presence of these clay drips would affect the efficiency of aquifer thermal energy storage. And also there, we could see that the anisotropy generated by these clay drapes would result in differences in efficiency of um, aquifer thermal energy storage. We have also worked um, in very different geologic media. And the examples I just showed were for a sand. In a project we are currently working on, we are working in a very different uh, environment. It's a hard rock aquifer, uh, chalk uh, from Cretaceous. And also there we see that hydraulic conductivity is very variable in space and it, that this is related to different geological formations, to folds, to hard grounds, to weathering and so on. And we could see, for example, as you can see on the graph um, on the left, um, when you do flow measurements in a boreholes, that the flow um, in one well is almost completely generated in a very small portion of the well and that the rest of the well is hardly contributing uh, to water production in the well. And this is also uh, completely related to um, geological heterogeneity. Then, um, we are currently also looking at heterogeneity of hydraulic conductivity in riverbeds. Um, in order to uh, characterize that, we do um, slack tests in the river, we do falling head tests in the rivers, we've done geophysical campaigns, we've done grain size measurements, we've done all kinds of uh, measurements uh, in the river. On a sunny day, as you can see on these pictures, it is quite pleasant uh, to be uh, in the river. On cold and rainy days, as we have quite a lot uh, in Belgium, it's much less pleasant. So I do hope when I show you some graphs and maps uh, of these results on the next slide, that you do appreciate the effort um, of my researchers who literally spent weeks and months in the river um, in all kinds of uh, weather uh, conditions. Um, these are just a few um, of the results, but also in this environment, in these riverbeds, we could see that um, hydraulic conductivity um, clearly is heterogeneous um, in this environment and th that this has effect on um, the distribution of the fluxes um, in, um, in the riverbed and thus has an effect on how the aquifer and the river um, interact. Okay, so I think we all agree that this heterogeneity is important. We should uh, take it to, into account to model flow, transport, for pumping tests, tracer tests, thermal transport, and so on. Um, but then, of course, we need methods and tools to do so. How do we get this geological heterogeneity that we see in the field? How do we get it into our uh, groundwater flow models? And the second lesson of today also is quite an obvious one. Well, there are plenty of methods um, to do so. Um, so, it would take me hours to give you a complete overview of all different methods that there are um, to, to deal with this heterogeneity in groundwater models. So I will only focus on the ones I know best and the ones we apply in my research group. And what we typically do is a combination of the following things. So we do a lot of field work, as you have seen in the previous slides, to map um, geological heterogeneity, to measure hydraulic conductivity, to do geophysical campaigns and so on, to characterize this heterogeneity. Um, then we typically use multiple point geostatistics to generate realistic patterns of geological heterogeneity, which we can use in our groundwater flow and transport models. And then we also uh, perform some uncertainty analysis after this to see how the uncertainty we obviously always have on the patterns of geological heterogeneity, how this uncertainty results in uncertainty on our model um, outputs. I'm pretty sure that for this audience here, I don't have to explain what hydrogeological fieldwork or groundwater modeling is about. So I will focus now a bit um, on, on this, on the multiple point geostatistics and on the uncertainty um, analysis. Multiple point geostatistics is essentially um, a method to simulate patterns of complex geological heterogeneity. For example, if we would um, have a pattern like you see on the slide with high conductivity channels in a lower permeability background, 
Um, obviously, this would have an effect on how groundwater um, behaves. And if we would use, for example, variogram-based simulations um, to simulate this, you see that we would not do a very good job in preserving uh, the, the continuity of these structures, um, for example. Um, and what we do in multiple point geostatistics is we define a training image uh, as an example, um, as the example you can see here. And a training image is a key concept in this method. So what we do is that we draw a picture of how we think geological heterogeneity looks like. So it's essentially a database of the patterns that we expect or what the geologists expect um, in a certain environment. And then what the simulation method does is to generate um, simulations which are consistent with, with this training image. So essentially you will see the same patterns of geological heterogeneity in the simulations as you have defined um, in your um, training image. And these patterns can then be used as an input for groundwater flow and transport models. The method was originally developed uh, in the petroleum industry for reservoir applications, but uh, there have been many different um, applications in groundwater um, in, the, in the past um, decades. Then, of course, um, the uncertainty we have about the geological um, heterogeneity will also induce uncertainty on, on hydraulic heads, on concentrations, and so on. Um, and with this multiple point geostatistics, we can see how this uncertainty um, results in uncertainty on the result. Um, but we could go much further, um, so we could also um, incorporate all kinds of different types of uncertainty. Again, there are many methods to do so, but um, this is a method which was developed by one of my um, PhD students. So he coupled the DREAM algorithm to ModFlow to incorporate not only uncertainty on the model parameters, such as hyd hydraulic conductivity, but also on abstraction, on recharge, and so on. Um, to see how this will result, uh, how this will affect your model results. Recently, he also extended this uh, methodology to also incorporate the uncertainty um, when you have different alternative conceptual models. I show you the training image. This training image is um, a picture of how you think uh, heterogeneity looks like. But of course, also there, there can be uncertainty. How these channels, for example, their thickness, uh, how they are oriented and so on. So instead of just using one training image, we could also use multiple training images to include that type um, of uncertainty. And of course, also on the boundary conditions of our models, we typically have lots of uncertainty um, in granted model. Also that can be um, included um, in different types of um, uncertainty methods um, to um, have an honest assessment of all these different types of uncertainty. Okay, so, so far we know that, yes, heterogeneity matters and there are plenty of tools available to deal with them. So let's move um, to the next lesson and this one probably needs a bit more um, explanation Lesson three is be careful if you're a perfectionist. So I guess this one uh, needs some explanation. So when I first learned about multiple point geostatistics many, many years ago, um, I was really very enthusiastic about this method. So I thought, wow, this is so elegant. This is so smart. This is so simple. And at that time, I had been working for quite some years in a geology department, although I'm, I'm an engineer um, originally. So I, I realized how complex geological heterogeneity was and actually how badly we were incorporating this into our groundwater models. So I thought, okay, this is it. This is like the method to incorporate um, all geological heterogeneity in a realistic way in our uh, groundwater models. And I also saw the method as a very interesting way of communicating with geologists because these training images are a very visual, very explicit representation of geological heterogeneity. 
So based on an image, it is very easy to have communication between a geologist and a modeler much more than if you would use a variogram, for example, uh, to do so. Um, so yeah, I was uh, completely convinced that this would be my next uh, research topic. So this is where um, my journey started for um, the perfect three-dimensional training image or the perfect geologi geological conceptual model. Um, I thought, yeah, now we have a method that can actually incorporate all this geological heterogeneity, so let's do that. And for example, from my fieldwork, I had two two-dimensional um, training images um, in, that are in, in perpendicular direction, and I wanted to make a three-dimensional training image of this, um, which would include all the details about geological heterogeneity I saw on the field, and I also hoped that these three-dimensional training images, if I would take two-dimensional cross-sections, would look exactly, well, exactly, would have exactly the same patterns as my two-dimensional training images. So that's where my journey started. Um, I used SBET, for example, which is a process-based simulator. Um, also, um, Alessandro Comunian from uh, Neuchâtel at the time, he did some magic uh, to make uh, three-dimensional training images. So um, we com came up with, uh, with those examples, which are actually quite good, but it took me uh, a really long time to realize that they were actually quite good because I was still worried that not all the continuity and the patterns were preserved um, in these patterns. Next to the search for this perfect uh, representation of geological heterogeneity, I also um, wanted to make the perfect groundwater model, because obviously if you want to have very fine scale heterogeneity into your groundwater model, you will need very, very small uh, cell sizes. So I ended up with a model looking like this, with millions of grid cells only for a very small part um, of the aquifer. So you can imagine it was not an, an easy model to work with, uh, very long computation times, especially because we wanted to do inverse modeling and certainty analysis. So we didn't have to run this model just once, but hundreds um, of times. So after obviously the many months and years I spent on perfectioning my models and my training images, I learned, look, um, you don't have to get it perfectly right, uh, you just have to get it going. And if you think about heterogeneity and if you incorporate it, you're already doing much better than most models where this type of heterogeneity would be completely um, ignored. So how can you avoid this type of um, frustrations, let's say? Well, if you um, compare your training image or your conceptual geological model to reality, it might be frustrating but of, because of course not all details will be in there. Maybe it's better um, to compare it to what people normally would do, a eh? much simpler um, approach. Also, it is very smart to do some kind of a sensitivity analysis, for example, to see what if my training image is slightly off, what if not all features are in there, does it really have a significant effect on my um, results? Okay, lesson four. Showing an explicit conceptual geological model is dangerous. This probably also uh, needs some um, explanation. If you would completely ignore geological heterogeneity and just say, look, I made a model of a silent aquifer and these, oops, sorry, these are my results, probably you would not get a lot of questions about heterogeneity. Also, if you would use a variogram, very standard uh, methods, you probably also will not get a lot of questions about he heterogeneity. But if you, as I did, show a training image like this one, it raises a lot of questions. So every time I showed training images like this in a conference or in a paper, people would ask me, but look, are you really sure that all these clay drapes are continuous? Maybe they are not continuous, maybe there are holes in there. Or, um, as you can see, some of the inclined clay drapes um, touch the clay drape above, others don't. Are you really sure this is true in reality? 
Are you really sure that all these clay drifts have the, the same angle and so on? So if you are very explicit about your assumptions that you make uh, about how your heterogeneity looks like, you also have the danger that people will criticize them, will question them. So if you do so, um, be prepared. Okay, and then I arrive to my uh, last lesson that I've learned um, throughout the years, which is, again, a very obvious one that every one of you will agree with. Real-world field cases are very different from synthetic cases. Let me explain why I want to end with that one. Well, actually, many of the methods that are developed when it comes to heterogeneity or uncertainty in the first paper, when they are published, are typically tested and applied on synthetic or semi-synthetic applications. What do I mean with synthetic applications? These are like hypothetical aquifers with hypothetical boundary conditions, hypothetical spatial distribution of hydraulic uh, conductivity, and hypothetical hydraulic heads and concentrations. And obviously, uh, when you read these papers, you can get very enthusiastic about the methods because you see very convincing results, very promising techniques, because of course, these synthetic examples are also chosen in such a way that the method looks good and results uh, in good um, results. So when I, uh, as, as more uh, a field hydro hydrogeologist, went to the field, collect data, and started applying all these methods on my data, it was often um, a, bit, a big frustration, disappointment, because my results for sure did not look uh, like theirs. And yeah, I could get results like the graph you see there, where the model completely didn't uh, fit um, the data. Um, so in the real world, Many other features than small-scale uh, hetero heterogeneity uh, play an important role. Um, and heterogeneity is often much more complex than the assumptions made in such uh, synthetic examples. In our case, for example, in the tracer test we did, um, there were some variations in pumping discharges we didn't know about. Um, the wells were screened in more than one layer and there was some uncertainty about that. Um, we also had quite a lot of uncertainty on the boundary conditions, which you typically have in groundwater models, which proved to be much more important than, than heterogeneity, um, for example. We had some sampling issues and so on and so on. I'm sure anyone who uh, does field hydrogeology can uh, relate to these kind of issues. So, I would um, strongly encourage that all these methods which originally were developed and designed on synthetic examples are also validated and tested on real-world applications. Although I'm not sure if after my talk today you still uh, dare <laughs> to, to do so. Um, but I think it's really important that we validate all these new algorithms and methods with in-situ measured groundwater levels um, and concentrations. And of course, we should always uh, wonder is it worth incorporating all this fine-scale geological heterogeneity or are maybe other features uh, more important and worth our investigation? So, these are the five lessons I wanted to share um, with you today when it comes to uh, dealing with geological heterogeneity in groundwater models. For sure, um, it matters. Um, we've seen that in so many different geologic media, in so many different um, applications. But it is good to um, not consider that as a dogma, but really look, well, how much does it matter? When does it matter? Um, there are so many methods and tools available, some very advanced, some very complex um, tools but always remember how far um, should I go um, in all this. Be careful if you're a perfectionist, your conceptual geological models and your groundwater models don't need to be perfect um, to, to incorporate um, heterogeneity. Remember that showing an explicit geological model can um, raise a lot of questions and comments and criti critiques um, about it. And of course, I strongly um, encourage real-world applications of all these different um, techniques. 
Okay, then I thank you um, for your attention and of course I will repeat, I hope to see you in Brussels in two years from now.